You're back with Baz. You are on the Australian uh, Community Radio Network and we're doing our Women in Blues special. And I'm talking to significant women in blues in the country. And I have with me the wonderful Fiona Boys. Fiona, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Baz. Now, let me take you back to the 80s when you first kicked off as a women in blues with your first band tell me what it was like performing as a blues woman in the 80s well the, actually before i got to the band if we're going to go right back to the beginning um i started off as a solo acoustic blues player playing finger picking country blues in in coffee shops and things like that so looking back on it um because i was a very fledgling player it, it was um, quite a, an uncompromising way of starting because when you're playing solo, there's nobody else to fall back on, you know. And at, you know, as a solo player of blues, it's almost like if you're not singing, you need to be playing, and if you're not playing, you need to be talking. You've got, you know. So, uh, but having said that, I'd, I'd only been playing out for about 18 months or so when I had the opportunity of joining the Mojos, which was an all-female black band, although it didn't start off necessarily to be an all-female band, um, not necessarily, it, the core of the band came together because there was a group of women who loved the blues so much that we knew each other from going to blues gigs, um, and, and we worked out at a party one, one night that, that we all had fledgling abilities on different instruments. I hadn't played electric up that, until that point, so I had to go and borrow an electric mm. um, because, you know, I thought, oh, look, it's stupid playing acoustic with the band. But um, so I think one of the things that was interesting about that band is that because we were all women and we were all sort of at the same point in our playing, we all just loved the music so much. It was a very supportive environment to begin our, um, our professional playing and exploring of, of, the, of the music because at that point while there were some very notable singers I was going to Kerry Simpson's gigs and people like that but no instrumentalists certainly no guitarists and um, yeah it's, it's tough because there's no role, role models for you there and um, and it was easy to feel a little isolated um, and, and so I guess moving as a bit of a, a block, we were able to support each other in those early days. And this uh, Woman in Blues initiative, while we're doing this special, is uh, being facilitated by the MBAS, the Melbourne Blues Appreciation Society. So they've decided to bring this to Melbourne. Tell us about your connection with the Melbourne Blues Appreciation Society. Well, I was there at the very beginning. I was actually um, in the initial, if not the first meeting, and certainly very early on the piece when um, at Helen Jennings, um, you know, flat, well, where a group of people who were passionate blues fans um, got together to talk about how great it would be to have an organisation like this. And I think I was certainly on the committee, I think the first committee as a, um, as a musician re representative and um, and of course the, the Blue Society has been a focus and for me then um, in the years intervening leading up to um, the connection of the NBAS as an affiliated member of the Blues Foundation in America and then when people when they started doing playoffs local competitions to send someone as a representative from Melbourne to the International Blues Challenge in Memphis. And to be honest, at that point, I, I stood back from it and watched that for many years. And it took really the encouragement of my husband, the preacher, um, to, he really got onto me, like to say, well, why don't you um, go into that competition or, or have a go? Because I think that is something about being a female in blues where there was, so few well no other women guitarists to speak of was that one of the ways i think i coped with that was that i was so passionate about music um 
my main focus was, and in fact still is, get to the next gig, do your very best for the audience always, um, and try and improve your musicianship. And even though I was fledgling in those days, that was all my, always my thing. And every musician, male or female, of whatever age, and I was starting a good 10 to 15 years behind my male peers. So I'm starting to play in my mid twenties and you know, play my first gig 28 or whatever. And you're keenly aware that all you, you, the guys who are playing have been maybe playing since their teens or younger in their garage. So you, you're, you're behind the eight ball in that way. But also you're getting up on stage and any performer um, puts themselves out there and um, it can be very, um, you can feel very vulnerable in that. And I think women can feel very vulnerable. They can feel judged by men and women. Well, you mentioned the IBC and the preacher telling you to go in there and convincing you to go in it. Not only did you compete in it, you won it. The first woman to win it, yeah. the first non-American to win it. Now yeah. that is, the, those accolades are just incredible. It was incredible. And as I said, it, it almost felt like it was more, it was more of a traumatic thing to go into the Melbourne competition. Uh, so to purposely put myself into a competitive space was very challenging for me. But I'm glad I did it. And I think in front of the hometown crowd, it was really tough. I was thrilled to have the opportunity to represent Melbourne. And at that stage, I wanted to go to America to do a blues pilgrimage, but as a musician, I was broke. So being sponsored by the MBAS meant that I had a ticket to Memphis. So it was my first trip to the States. Everything was new, everything was fresh and intriguing. And I felt really profoundly that I was um, competing in this event, which is all held um, on Beale Street, which is a very historic place for the blues. And here I am in a bar playing my original songs, including my song about Memphis Mini at the time, I'm playing solo acoustic country blues. And I was sort of just really struck by the notion that all my heroes would have played on that street back in the day. And, and how wonderful, just how surpassingly wonderful it was to have the opportunity to be there and, and think about that and think of the blues as a historic thread with those connections to players that you've admired and revere in the past and, and to be there. So while the competition is competitive <laughs> and it's highly competitive and you know there were people there that were really gonna win, gonna win. For me I was just enjoying the experience and just thought well I, I had no expectations really of winning. I just thought well uh, all you can do is be who you are and try and do your best, play your songs, tell your stories. Now, your biggest influence. So you mentioned a lot of wonderful blues women. Mm -hmm. Who's been your biggest? Who is the one that has made all the difference to your career? Well, although I don't think I play like her, I'd have to say Memphis Mini. And I think any um, female blues guitarist that didn't um, give a shout out to Mini, like, what's going on, you know, because um, she really was the female guitarist of her era. And, and again, I, you know, I've written songs about her and, you know, I remember as, when I first started as a fan of the music and I was listening to a lot of early blues and it took me a while after a while, I was like, where are the women? And, and I remember I was given a Memphis mini album, um, and there she was on the cover looking so fabulous in all in dressed well with her guitar and just looking confident and feisty and like she totally owned that guitar and I think that was profound as a role model even if I haven't modeled a lot of my playing on I think you know she she needs to be better known but there's a lot of 
female players that probably need to be better known. People in the you know really acoustic, you know, section of the genre may know Elizabeth Cotton, and I came to people like Sister Rosetta Tharp later because she'd been pigeonholed more as gospel. But man, that gal was rocking. She could tear it up. Those mm. single notes solos were really rock and roll, you know, and and it's. You know, I think it's a shame that some of those women have been somewhat bypassed by history. You know, given the reverence that you know people have for, you know, with all due respect, someone like Robert Johnson. You look at Minnie and how many her sheer output. You know, she recorded hundreds of sides, and um, and and she developed a lot as a guitarist from playing more country blues into pioneering. Um, you know, she, she played electric when she went to Chicago later on and she was one of the pioneers of that um, electric Chicago guitar and single string soloing and so from country blues beginnings, she even in that space she was innovative because she bought one of the first, um, you know, resonator guitars from acoustic to resonator to electric and um, yeah, I, I feel like and a songwriter and a singer, you know, she, she deserves to be better known perhaps than she is. Absolutely awesome. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Fiona, as it always is. Thank you so much for being part of this Women in Blues special. 